Hey, do you teach yoga? Have you ever trained to lead yoga classes to be a yoga therapist? Have you ever owned a yoga studio? Maybe even just wondered what it was like for the women and men up there in front of the room on their mats, leading you through endless Surya Namaskars, down dogs, and pranayamas galore? Well, these are their stories and mine. I'm Rebecca Sebastian, a 20-year yoga teacher, 10-year yoga therapist, yoga studio owner, and co-founder of a yoga-focused nonprofit. I've done a lot in the yoga world over the last 20 years, pretty much everything except had a water cooler. You know, a place to share stories, talk about struggles, successes, and find other people who do the same thing that I do. Welcome to Working in Yoga, a podcast and substitute water cooler for yoga folks to connect and build community, to share our unique profession, our challenges, and our journeys with the world. Welcome friends to Working in Yoga. This week, there is another bonus episode from my friend Pooja Varani on the podcast. And if you can't tell, Pooja and I are friends in real life too. She and I met at a yoga conference in early 2022 that the former nonprofit that I co-founded was hosting. And she taught some incredible programs on the LGBTQ plus inclusivity in the yoga space and on pain-free movement. She and I got talking about the yoga industry, as I do with literally anyone who's been in my presence for five minutes and who also knows about yoga, and we found that we had a lot in common in our views and beliefs. So this episode is a precursor to next year's perfectionism segment. This recording is the first time I ever talked about my own journey through the perfectionism culture and moral superiority that is cultivated in the yoga space. And if I'm being honest, it made me incredibly nervous to talk about it when we recorded last year in 2022. But I'm going to be really truthful. I have flat out failed and picked myself up so many times in my life, especially in the last two years, that I am more comfortable discussing how I'm not perfect than I was even 18 months ago. And the skill of failing has made me smarter and faster than other folks, especially in business. So now I see my ability to fail as an asset, a hard one, an uncomfortably one asset, but not something that necessarily keeps me unsafe. Maybe you also felt that being quote unquote, a perfect yogi was how you justify being in the industry. Maybe you feel like you aren't doing enough on a daily basis and you wander through your yoga space, hoping that nobody finds out that you eat chips and scroll TikTok on the weekends. I remember when I trained to be a yoga therapist some 11 years ago, the people would look around the room guiltily if they didn't practice yoga, hashtag every damn day. We've created this culture of perfectionism. And as you'll hear in January, I think a lot of us feel comfortable here because we were raised in households and environments that expected you to be perfect in order to receive love and attention. I sure was. So when I came to a yoga space that told me to be perfect and find the quote unquote full expression of the pose and asked me to shift into a more perfect diet, a more perfect attitude, a more perfect everything in order to evolve and enlightenment, that felt like a pretty normal ask. I honestly didn't question it for a second, but now I'm really ready to dive in and deconstruct that wholly and see what comes next. Maybe you too. Take a listen and find out. Before we begin, a note on Jiva Mukti Yoga, I did some fact checking and it seems that their teachers are not required to be vegan as we referenced when recording this podcast early last year. And I did reach out to a friend who is certified as a Jiva Mukti teacher and she said that as far as she knows, it is quote unquote strongly suggested, but not required. And of course, before we start listening to the episode, please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. And if you want my newsletters, head to the show notes and subscribe to those too. But here we go. My conversation about perfection and moral superiority with Pooja Varani. Welcome, friends, to another episode of the Pooja Chronicles on working in yoga. Pooja and I are unpacking a big topic today. And so before we begin, Pooja, will you please tell everybody who you are, where you're located? Absolutely. My name is Pooja Varani. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm located in 
Monahoke, uh, former Monahoke territory, uh, the Plains, Virginia, about an hour outside of DC. And I am a pain-free movement specialist and a social justice consultant who uses yoga as my vehicle to both talk about those aspects of race and LGBTQ and gender justice, as well as to talk about moving and living without physical and emotional pain. So thank you so much for sharing that. And we have, I'm pausing because this topic makes me nervous, partially because I am still trying to unravel it myself a little bit because I have spent the last 20 plus years really immersed in the yoga world. Um, but our topic today is, here's what I titled it. Do you, do you know more than I do? Western yoga and wellness and the slide into moral superiority. And I had a moment this past weekend that I'll share where I was teaching a yoga class and everybody had left and it was all the aftermath of the class. You know, the props were everywhere and I was going to sanitize them and pick them up and fold them. And I realized how much of my adult life had happened in these yoga spaces and how much of my adult life I felt like I was judging myself and other people for making the right decisions or the wrong decisions and how I felt like especially Western yoga, really white folks, Western yoga set me up in this idea of me feeling like I was morally superior to other people. I was moving my body. Wasn't I a good girl? I was eating the right food. Aren't I a good girl? I don't drink. I still don't drink. I don't do drugs. I don't drink caffeine very often making all those right choices. And I, it's, it's something that I think slides into the insidiousness of diet culture in our industry and how we feel like we're morally superior. So Pooja, I don't know how you feel about that, but. That was a doozy. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> like I'm wringing my hands. Y'all can't see me, but I'm like wringing my hands. It makes me nervous to talk about it. <laughs> there was no foreplay. You just jumped right into that, didn't you? I did. <laughs> and. I think it's it's such an important topic. It really is because it's always struck me at this whole idea, the way yoga teachers in the West, or not even just in the West, but in Western culture, I'll say, carry themselves. There's this almost condescension, or there's this, I know more than you, or I am truly that guru. I am truly that teacher. And that's always struck me as odd and a little bit wrong. So let's go a little further into that, Rebecca. Well, I will tell you, I've had this topic on my mind for a long time, but one of the things that really recently put it in the forefront of my mind, especially in how moral superiority can us be, it can be in relation to us being more morally superior in all of our decision-making. So in my yoga studio, I am launching what I'm calling a member journey, right? So our members are going to do things in order to get stuff like tea and a mug. And one of the things I want to do is when a member hits 100 classes, I want to buy them a cake, like a locally made from an amazing baker cake. And we can just have a party like, well done, you took 100 classes. And the amount of pushback that I got from a couple folks on my team, particularly, but also in just the general yoga community of how could you dare buy people cake? Shouldn't that be fruit? Sugar and gluten? Are you sure? I love fruit. I've always loved fruit. And cake is damn delicious. Yeah, it is. <laughs> Cake is my favorite thing. <laughs> and it just made me feel like I was like, oh, so so some of our culture, this culture of what I'm calling moral superiority also kind of is like a killjoy, right? Like, like you mean to tell me I can't buy somebody a cake because it's got sugar in it? And, and, and I realized we do that in so many different ways. Like there has to be like, like, I want us to all just like have a seat for a moment in the judgment of how we live our lives, how other people live their lives. 
I think in order for us to be on this path of, you know, spiritual evolution, say, like being the best version of ourselves, for a moment, can we all just pause and give each other a hug and say, man, you're doing great. Do you want some cake? I mean, cake is for celebration. And I think that's why it's so great that you give people cake, right? <laughs> because it's something we do for birthdays and not everyone, ha we have a birthday once a year. At my house, I have a birthday twice a year because we are very big about celebrating half birthdays Ooh, and nice. half anniversaries and half as many as you can things because there aren't enough celebrations during a year. But I think the symbolism of just having of celebrating it, right? Without shame, without guilt is so significant. Okay, so tell me, Pooja, have you had this idea of like the this sort of like judgment that happens? Like surely I can't be the only one who feels like there's like a judgy thing that we're that's hanging out in the yoga world. In the oh, no, no, no. I mean, I had a yoga teacher. We had gone for lunch, three of us yoga teachers, and um, there's a really great Mexican Indian place near me. So it's because Mexicans and Indians, we use a lot of the same spices. We just use them in different ways. So fantastic concept. And my friend apologized to me for drinking a Coke. She said, sometimes I just like the caffeine. And I said, why are you apologizing about drinking a Coke? we're having lunch, we're having Mexican food, like enjoy yourself. And she said, well, sometimes when I tell that to yoga folks, they kind of look at me weird or they look at me like this is an unhealthy thing. So I've definitely seen that happen, right? And not just with food about, oh, I, I'm sure we'll get into other things, but it's just this whole, if you're a yoga teacher, you have to abstain from any quote unquote sins. You have to abstain from Coke and you have to abstain from dairy and you have to abstain from whatever that else is going on. Yeah. Um, you want to talk about veganism for a sec? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so there's been a lot of debate about whether yoga teachers and people who practice yoga should be vegans. And Rebecca's going to talk about where that myth came from, because it is a myth. But what I wanted to focus on is just, I don't know why it's a thing. I don't know why anyone <laughs> once decided, hey, you have to be vegan in order to practice yoga because yoga says you should be vegan. Because yoga doesn't say you should be vegan. Like, where the fuck did you read that? Like, seriously, <laughs> like, come find me the Sanskrit text that that says that if you can find me this Sanskrit text that says that I swear to God, I will send you a hundred dollars. Okay. Because there is no Sanskrit text that says that, right? Like I grew up Hindu and as somebody who grew up Hindu and Hinduism is one of the religions from which yoga sprung, I will tell you, we love our dairy. Like we love our dairy. We have this entire thing that we make for religious ceremonies called Amrit, right? Which means the nectar of immortality, but we make it as a special offering to the God. So when we're doing a puja, my name means a prayer so ceremony, and it's a special occasion, we might make Amrit. And it's a combination of things that are definitely not vegan. It's a combination of honey, of butter, of milk, of yogurt, it's all these things that aren't vegan because these were things that were revered. The reason we don't kill cows in India, right, that Hindus don't kill cows, is not because we worship the cows, but because we view dairy as so valuable. We view all the byproducts of cows as so valuable that we want to treasure them, right? We want to allow them that, th that thing and we want to appreciate for them that. And there's also a whole tie into a myth about Krishna and how Krishna, who was one of the avatars or incarnations of God on earth, how Krishna was a cowherd. So it's for these two reasons, right? We really, really, really prioritize dairy. So again, this just boggles my mind, right? Like, where did you get this idea that you can't teach yoga if you're not vegan? <laughs> so, um, and 
I think one of the places that I think we can say that this idea of yogis, good yoga practitioners being vegan is we can land a little bit at this at Jiva Mukti's feet. So if you don't know the tradition of Jiva Mukti, and this, to be honest with you, isn't too much of a dig on Jiva Mukti, because I do think actually in the United States, we have a long very long, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years long tradition of austerity and this idea of, and this could go back to Quakerism, right? Like Quakers also believe that if you gave stuff up, you were better. And, but the Jiva Mukti tradition with a Sharon Gannon and David Life, um, actually really in their tradition, their teachers are required to be vegan. And there's also been these huge, these stories that have come out of this tradition. And they were really one of the first yoga, I don't know if we want to call them a lineage, but we'll call them a school that really talked and were very forward about how veganism was the thing. And the stories in the early 2000s, when I was taking um, yoga classes and, you know, the yoga community in the country was a little bit smaller and we would chat a little bit amongst ourselves of those teachers coming up to students in Jiva Mukti classes and saying, you smell like you eat meat. And the shame that we have been doling out of people who are meat eaters, who um, are eating dairy in any sort of way. And I mean, like veganism, some some vegan, veganism is, you could consider it fairly militant. And if this is you, again, I love you. I don't, none of us need your emails. I love you. I want you to eat whatever it is that makes you feel happy. But what makes you feel happy does not need to be the same thing that makes other people feel happy. Absolutely. And I don't eat meat. I don't drink alcohol and I don't do substances because I am Hindu. So yes, these things are tied into my religious and my religious upbringing and my yogic upbringing and as a yoga practitioner, I'm going to do exactly what you said. I'm not going to judge anyone for what they eat, right? Because there's as much as I was told not to eat those things as a Hindu, there are also stories of Hindus 5,000 years ago, potentially the Pandavas and Krishna eating meat, right? There's some controversy about that, but there are stories about that, right? So what it comes down to for me is, do I think we should eat less meat as a planet for the sake of the planet? Yes right? Meatless Monday, fantastic concept. Do I think we should eat less factory farmed meat? Absolutely, right? <laughs> Can we have local, locally grown, locally farmed, sustainable meat or sustainable dairy products? We have chickens in my backyard, so all of our eggs come from our chickens, right? And can we say that for some folks, their best form of ahimsa is being vegan and not causing pain to an animal? Yes. Does that mean that's ahimsa for everyone? No. So let's stop judging and saying we're morally superior because we don't eat meat or we do eat meat or we're on a raw diet or whatever we're eating right now. Done? Yeah? Yes. Can we just end the podcast right there? I mean, like, yes. <laughs> eat what makes you feel good, folks. We love you. The end. Exactly. Right. <laughs> um, I would love to go on a rant about some other stuff while we're doing this. <laughs> I very much want you to do that. So right. talk to me about Kundalini yoga. Yeah, but moral superiority is not confined to food. It's confined to so many aspects of yoga right now. So one of the things that just weirds me out, okay? And I know I'm going to get some pushback. So please don't email me. Please don't send me your hate mail. I don't need it, okay? You can just rant in your house and rant to your friends about how much you don't like me, but I'm going to tell you, this is really weird, kundalini yoga. It's weird. You know why it's weird? Because I'm Hindu, and I'm Hindu because I'm brown, because my parents are Indian, because I was brought up in this culture, because my grandparents were Hindu, because the people before me were Hindu. Am I also a religious mutt? Yes. I have a lot of friends who are Buddhist and Sikh, and I've been taught about those religions from them. And I've brought been brought into them in very organic ways and been taught that I can practice religious traditions there. This is something very common in India to have this intermingling. So is it okay to have that intermingling? Yes. It still weirds me out though, as a person of color to have this entire sort of yoga based off of Sikhism with everyone being white. And it weirds me out because these religions are traditionally brown. 
So how can you have an offshoot of this religion that suddenly decided, well, this is only okay for white people? Like, yes, we are going to take the same principles that exist in Sikhism, but instead of trying to learn more about Sikhism and trying to practice Sikhism and trying to get indoctrinated and learn from folks who've had this in their ancestral history for generations, we're going to make up our own kind that's only practiced by white folks. And when it's only practiced by white folks, there's going to be a lot of shit that goes down. We might pronounce words incorrectly. <laughs> we might not know what the hell we're talking about. We might not actually be able to read Gurumukhi, which means we can't read the principal text of Sikhism, which is the Guru Granth Sahib, which my grandmother, even though she's Hindu, was able to read because there's a lot of intermingling of different religions and cultures in India, and she learned how to read Gurumukhi. So she would, even as a Hindu, she would read this religious text every morning right? And there's all this white privilege to that as well, right? And I'm calling it out for what it is. It's white privilege. Because after 9-11, there were six all over the U.S. who were attacked for wearing turbans, right? There were Muslims who were attacked for wearing turbans. How many white folks wearing turbans have you seen be attacked because they're wearing turbans? Mm. I think it's it's important to note then that we're making the connection that you are making the connection that moral superiority in this case equates to white supremacy. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. That doesn't mean that somebody's a white supremacist. What it does mean is that privileges are undeniable. Right. I have a lot of privilege, even as a brown person. I have educational privilege. I have privilege of speaking English as my first language and being born in the US, we all have privilege, right? But when you're using that privilege in a way that gives you these entitlements and that can literally save your life when those folks from whom you're taking these traditions and cultures from are being threatened and being killed for these same things you are practicing without consequence, there's a problem. Do you see that same sort of dynamic happening in um, practices in the West, like Kirtan? Oh, absolutely. Kirtan is a huge one for me too, because again, I'm talking a lot about my history just because, again, I was raised in a household where we did learn yoga, where I did learn philosophy and history just without those names, right? Because they are part of my culture and they're part of the culture that my parents happened to practice, my grandparents happened to practice and my entire family happened to practice. So for those of you who don't know, Kirtan is when it's religious singing where you have one person or devotional singing where you have one person singing and others listening. Now in the US, what often happens or in Western gatherings, I've seen that somebody's singing and then a lot of other folks are like dancing around in hippie clothing, which for me coming up, like growing up Hindu, that's completely unacceptable, right? Because the proper way to show respect to the gods would be to sit quietly, to sit in Sakasana or, um, Sakasana or lotus pose or another one of those poses that we have in yoga for the explicit purpose of praying and meditating, <laughs> right? That's why we practice getting more flexible so we can sit in these poses. So it'd be sitting quietly and listening. Or one thing that was very common, I did this every Sunday growing up, was a thing called bhajan. And bhajan was call and response devotional singing, right? So a couple of things bug me about kirtan. One, Folks tend to mispronounce words all the time, right? And this bugs me because if you're going to say something in another language, you should endeavor to say it correctly. You may, I, I speak Spanish fluently. Is my accent 100% there? No. Will I sometimes mess up words? No. Will I work really hard to doing it as well as I can? Yes, because it's not my culture and I'm trying to learn another one, right? The second thing is they won't understand the words they're reading or saying, because the translations, either they haven't looked at the translations or the translations they've gone have been from a primarily white audience or white folks who do not, in fact, speak Sanskrit. I'm not saying that white folks can't speak Sanskrit. My brother speaks Sanskrit. He studied this. And one of his favorite, his favorite translation of the Bhagavad Gita is Barbara Stoller Miller. So it was written by a white woman who just has studied and speaks and understands Sanskrit really well, right? So who's translating what you're reading, right? Is it 
Charles Smith down the street, or is that someone who spent the past 30 years studying Sanskrit and can actually give you a historically, culturally rooted definition of Sanskrit? And the last one, and this is a crazy story. You ready for this crazy story? I am so ready. <laughs> so some of you know that I did my teacher training, my first teacher training at Kripalu, at the Kripalu Center for Yoga and Health. And I remember being there and Kripalu has kirtan once a week. And so some of my fellow YTT trainees would go there. And I was always very surprised about this because they told me they were atheists. So I remember one time I had a discussion with them and I was kind of playing dumb. And I said, well, what did you do? We went to Kirtan. Why'd you go to Kirtan? It made me feel good. Great, what did you do in Kirtan? Oh, somebody sang and we kind of listened and we danced around. And I said, what did they sing? And they told me some of the lyrics. And I said, how'd you feel as an atheist going to a place that's about religion? And they said, that's not what it's about. And I said, you just told me you were singing Hare Rama, Hare Krishna. That's a Nama Vali. That's what we call it, a Nama Vali, where you list names of gods. It can be anything, Krishna, Jesus, Muhammad, <laughs> any religion, right? <laughs> yes. And in my religious center, we, we uplift them all because we believe in the unity of all religions, right? But it can be, you're literally chanting God's name. It's not your Christian God, but you are chanting a God's name and you're telling me you're an atheist. Is that not a little bit disrespectful, right? And I think that's the biggest just example of this moral superiority, like folks who are looked upon. I mean, if you just look at Rebecca, do, do you know folks who play music in their yoga classrooms? I do. I do not allow it in my studio, but I absolutely do know people who, who play music. What kind of music do they play and why don't you allow it in your studio? I don't allow it in my studio for two very, very different reasons. One is that music is dang expensive and BMI and ASCAP and CSAC will sue you for tens of thousands of dollars for playing unlicensed music. And the second is when I trained to be a yoga teacher and as a yoga student, I didn't have music. I was taught that music was a distraction. Absolutely. Right. So one, does it even make sense within this context Two, if you are at an explicitly music event, who are you having sing? Right. Every time I've seen yoga festivals and seen who's been uh, who's been the main musical headlight. Ninety nine percent of the time they're white. Right. They don't speak Sanskrit. They're singing mantras in Sanskrit. They're singing Buddhist mantras and Hindu mantras in Sanskrit, but they don't actually pronounce the words. They don't know, I don't think they actually understand what they're saying. And they're doing it in a way that's so divorced from Indian musical traditions that it, it kind of makes me upset as somebody of that because it makes me upset because it's not like there aren't billions, because there are billions of us, like there aren't billions of South Asians who've grown up in these traditions who can actually pronounce those words, who understand their meaning, not just the literal meaning, but their contextual meaning. And a lot of those folks do speak English. A lot of those folks, there are so many Indian American artists or Bangladeshi American artists or Sri Lankan American artists. There are so many musicians, even within Europe and the US and other places who speak those, the native languages, right? Who'll speak English or who'll speak French, but also have grown up in this tradition. So why are we only relegating this to white folks? And then we're saying, hey, here's this great person. Here's MC Yogi. Wow, what a fantastic yogi. They must be so much better than us and neglecting other folks. So it's interesting. Like, um, I think one of the things that we need to talk about real quick here in this idea of moral superiority is this concept called proximity to power. And um, what essentially that is, is that in white supremacy, we're assuming there is an underlying assumption within white supremacy that white people are at the top of the ladder. And we are positioning ourselves as somebody who is not a cishet white man within proximity to that cishet white man who's at the top of the of the rung now white folks can go ahead and take and monetize and use things from other cultures like music like chanting like religious deities that you will see you know namaste or those like ohm t-shirts that you purchase at thousands of yoga studios all across the country 
Um, and white folks have the privilege of being able to take something from a culture that is not ours, that is made up entirely of brown folks, South Asian folks in this example, but this happens in thousands of different examples. And it's important that we acknowledge that it is an absolute privilege to be able to take something from another culture and tour your own culture, your own country, making money off of someone else's culture. And, and so this idea of moral superiority, also we have this idea that white folks who do that have, they're more well-traveled. It actually makes white folks look better when they do this more like, oh, you're so exotic. Oh, you understand other things. And there's so much at play here that we in the Western yoga scene really don't talk about enough. Absolutely, especially when those folks who are actually from these cultures who may have that Indian accent are looked down upon, right? Or when yes. folks of color aren't getting jobs teaching yoga, right? I've mentioned this on one of these episodes before, but until the pandemic happened, I didn't even know there were other South Asian Americans teaching yoga because I hadn't encountered one from the thousands of yoga classes I've taken over the past 15, 20 years. I think that this sort of harkens to this idea of virtue signaling. So Pooja, will you tell us a little bit about how you see white folks, especially virtue sig signaling as we are acting morally superior in our, in our industry? Absolutely. Um, I think it's... <sighs> Okay, I'm going to use a Susanna Barkataki definition here because the Susanna's fant fantastic and if you haven't read her book yet, um what is it called? Embodying Yoga's Roots, is that yes. it? Yes, yes, okay. and it's very very good. Go get it, y'all. It's the way I wanted to hate the book, but it's the book I wish I had written. I really do because it just says everything I'd been thinking my entire life and it says it so articulately, right? So yeah, her definition, good. she actually uses we'll, we'll use her definition is actually of a related term called glamorization, right? Glamorization involves taking cultural symbols, signs, art and icono iconography out of context and using them for one's own purposes to telegraph spirituality or wisdom. So I've seen so many folks, right, who are not of these cultures, not of these traditions, wear kundalini turbans and be looked upon as other folks, by other yoga folks as like, that's a committed yogi. That's committed yogi because they're wearing this turban all the time, right? Om tattoos, right? This person is has a tattoo on their body. They must be really into this thing. Saying the must they at the end of a class, which is hilarious. If you haven't seen this on my Instagram yet, I have a whole <laughs> namaste they post. I have many namaste they posts. Um, but I had one teacher who at the end of the class would say with this very serious grave tone, and I say to you, namaste. Right. Which to me is hilarious because it's like, and I say to you, hello. Right. <laughs> so it's this idea that, you know, this this privilege that you don't get when you're a person of color. Right. Because if I say this stuff, I mean, I get called upon all the time and say, well, what does this mean in Sanskrit? I don't know. I don't speak Sanskrit. That's why I call it my brother, the person who actually studied this really complicated language. Right. How many of you all speak Latin, even if you grew up Christian? Right. This is a complicated language. So a lot of times it's just assumed I speak these things and I don't get compensated for knowing these things. I don't get appreciated. I don't get held up on this pedestal. Oh yeah. But when a white person writes a book <laughs> about, you know, yoga, it's like, oh, we're going to sell this book because they must know so much because they've traveled to India and they've seen other cultures. Right. I mean, am I, am I getting the point across or or are we, do we need to add to this? No, I mean, I think this is so right exactly on because all of this sort of contributes to this idea of us being like morally superior. And um, I am going to slide, if it's okay with you, I'm going to slide into this idea of the moral superiority of nervous system regulation. Yeah, let's do it. Um, and part of this is it's something that I have been seeing for 
quite a while in the yoga space and it took me a long time to have the words to actually express what I see. And as you referenced earlier, because honestly, Pooja, you and I aren't very far apart. Now I do eat fish, but I don't eat traditional land meat at all. Um, I am not a drinker. I don't use any other sorts of substances. I don't smoke cigarettes. I restrict caffeine, all the quote unquote good things that I do and have done for years. And what I see us do in yoga spaces is act like people like me are morally superior. But the truth is there's a thousand ways to regulate your nervous system. And I started teaching this in my self-care workshops is that I teach people that alcohol is a nervous system regulator, TikTok is a nervous system regulator, pot is a nervous system regulator, sex is a nervous system regulator, so is meditation, so is movement, so is all, so are all the things journaling, all those things that we're supposed to be doing versus not doing. So I want us to explore the idea, what if absolutely everything that you could do to regulate your nervous system, be it eating a piece of cake or meditating for 15 minutes, what if they're all morally neutral? What if instead of acting like I am superior for choosing the yoga or meditation versus somebody else who's choosing to eat chips and watch TikTok, what if they're all morally neutral? What if we just accept that people are doing whatever they have to do to regulate their nervous systems and we're all doing our best? And sometimes we make decisions that we pay for later on, whether it's, you know, going to get drunk at a bar or scrolling social media and you feel like you've numbed out to the point where you can't interact with people for the rest of the day. What if we just consider everything to be morally neutral? I will say in the 20 plus years that I have been a yoga practitioner and teacher, that yoga taught me that morally superior things in yoga were better nervous system regulators. And it also stripped me of anything that would be really helpful in times of crisis when I couldn't make the quote unquote good decision. When I was so down and I, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, 13 years ago when my ex-husband left me and I was a single mom with an infant and I had was teaching one yoga class a week. And from that moment, I had to build a business and feed my son. And I remember just being so low and looking around going, I just want to escape this and I have nothing. I don't have a glass of wine. I don't have a piece of cake. I'm not supposed to be, you know, scrolling Facebook for hours because, you know, 13 years ago, we were only all on Facebook. I had nothing because I was so invested in this idea of moral superiority and quote unquote right decision making. And that really, I mean, that was one of those fundamental things that I think changed me. And I realized how messed up that was, right? Like, like if I was so low that one night I decided to, you know, eat chips, drink a glass of wine and scroll TikTok, I would have felt so guilty because I wasn't quote unquote being a good yoga person, a good yoga practitioner. Now I am always very conscious. I don't call myself a yogini. I feel like that's not a title that I can give myself. So I always use the extra words, but I wasn't a good yoga practitioner if I did those things. And, and I don't think that's healthy. I think that contributes to things like diet culture and it, it contributes to things in yoga, like folks who have differently sized bodies, who have differently abled bodies, feeling uncomfortable in our spaces because we are all so fixated on this moral superiority of our bodies looking a certain way, us consuming certain things, putting certain things in our mouths, in our eyeballs, in our earballs. Um, it just, I want us to rethink that to be kinder, gentler, more loving humans within the industry to ourselves and our colleagues. I could just hear the pain and that past grief and sorrow in your voice, just having those options taken away from you, right? Intentionally or not, just having, feeling like those could not be things you did without losing part of yourself. 
Yeah, it's really true. I, I and you know, I mean, now as an as an older, wiser woman, I, I can look at my younger self and say, Oh, I wish I would have just said that was nonsense. But at that time, when I was 30 years old, I was so, so much of my identity was wrapped up in yoga in being a good yoga person in being a yoga teacher in being a yoga practitioner at that point i'd been practicing for 11 years at age 30 very consistently through that whole time and yoga helped me become pain-free this is work that you do puja and pain-free movement um i came to yoga because i had hip dysplasia as a baby so i had chronic pain early on in my life and yoga really gave me this gift, right, of like no pain. And I felt like I needed to honor that by always making the quote unquote right decisions, the morally superior decisions, instead of accepting myself for the like human being that I was that, you know, there were some nights I would have slept better if I would have had a glass of wine and some chocolate cake, as opposed to like trying to struggle through meditation for hours and hours and going, I'm failing at this and I'm failing at life. And I, I just don't want, I feel like this judgment we hand each other that I handed myself, I don't want to pass that on into this new generation of people who are yoga teachers. Absolutely. I mean, it took me years and years and years to get myself to therapy. And it took me an even longer time to get myself to onto antidepressants. Do I want to be on antidepressants for the rest of my life? No. <laughs> but there was so much shame about it, right? Because hashtag yoga is my therapy. Yes. And yoga is my therapy. It is. Working out has always been my therapy. And it's part of a holistic solution, right? Yoga can't be all of my therapy. It can be my physical therapy at times. So can running, so can weightlifting. It can be um, my movement therapy. But there is some beauty in talk therapy. There's beauty in art. There's beauty in TV and Netflix and movies. There's beauty in food, all sorts of food, including chocolate cake, right? <laughs> this judgment we have and this belief that all you need is yoga. It's really, I wish we could just allow ourselves the grace of having more, really just having the full human experience and realizing that none of us are perfect and it's okay to want and need other things. And in fact, that is human. It is so human to allow ourselves the grace of having more. Oh, I want that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I'm waiting until you make that. For, you can give me that in Iowa in a month. <laughs> <laughs> Deal. <laughs> I mean, it's just so, so poignant, this idea that I mean, almost like what we've been talking about, this this sort of superiority complex that I think I see us have here in the yoga industry. It's like you said, like it's the antithesis of yoga. It just doesn't. I mean, yoga, there's there's controversy around whether it's a religion or not. But one thing I think we can all agree upon is that yoga has always been a path of inquiry, right? Going 5,000 years back, 3,000 years back, neti, neti, not this, not this, right? It was this way before Descartes, way before the other thinkers. It was, I am not this. I am not this apple. I'm not this tree. What am I? I don't know. So I'm going to keep on asking these questions, right? It's always been a path of inquiry, a path of asking questions. And sometimes those questions right now, I'm on a thing called the FODMAP, which is a sort of elimination diet. I don't like the word diet because it's not really a diet. I'm trying to figure out what foods work for my body and what don't. And I'm just getting very, very curious about it. Hmm. I retried garlic. How does my body react to this? Is garlic inherently bad? No. Is it inherently good? No. Is it good for my body? Let me find out, right? It's all about what is good for my body? What is good for my community? What is good for the world? Thank you so much, Pooja. Again, thank you so much for these conversations. I can't tell you how much they mean to me. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for listening, friends. Next week is my year-end wrap-up episode where I count down the significant things that happened within the yoga industry this year in 2023. I was very nervous to write this episode all by myself, but turns out that I have a pretty substantial list and I can't wait to share it with you. 
And thank you to my sponsor, as always, Sunlight Streams. If you want to experience my self-care work this year, head to the show notes and find out more on our online self-care weekend on January 6th and 7th, 2024. You can also visit the website www.thesunlightexperience.com backslash self-care 2024. Thank you again, as always, for listening. I am so grateful you're here with me, and I'll catch you on break time around the water cooler next week.